My name is Hatler Hund Lodotir, and I'm the director of Iceland School of Energy at Reykjavik University and the chair of this session. We're lucky to have with us today Dr. Anatoly Solutushin, who's a professor at the Gupkin Russian State University of Oil and Gas. He serves as, a, as, as deputy councillor on international affairs and is a director of the Institute for Arctic Oil and Gas Technologies. Today, Professor Anatoly is going to give us a talk about opportunities and challenges of oil in the Arctic. Professor Anatoly, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in this uh, amusing uh, building, and it is a very nice city in a very friendly country, despite the strong wind, you know. So we'll talk about Arctic Petroleum, existing opportunities, and the uh, challenges which are there. And we st start first with the uh, petroleum resources, just a very short overview. As you can see, in 2010, we consumed about uh, uh, 9 billion tons of oil equivalent, which is approximately 70 billion barrels of oil equivalent altogether. And 54% of that comes to oil and gas. Do we like it or not? It's the truth, you know, and we have to cope with that. So if we divide 7 million, 7, uh, 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 7 million tons of oil equivalent, approximately, that's what we consumed, by 7 billion people uh, living in the world. So we'll see that each of us consume approximately one ton of oil equivalent per year. And then we come with the empty can and replace it with the other one. So it goes for nearly 40 years. And the forecast for the future is also the same, almost the same. So we will consume approximately, as it's shown here. No, it's not there. But I have it on my screen. Yes, OK. Yes, here. So we will consume approximately 18 billion tons of oil equivalent, or 130 billion barrels of oil equivalent, altogether, of which 52% will come from oil and gas. Again, do we like it or not? This is a forecast. OK? And our population will grow to 9 billion people by 2040. So we will consume one ton of oil equivalent in gas and liquid. Again, do we like it or not? So we have to cope with that. Okay. You can read it in the report made, of course, of the Russian Academy of Science. Of course, but well, there are different reports also, BP and ExxonMobil, so they're very close to the same conclusion. To the same conclusion. So those who are planning how much we should use, they are thinking about our prosperity and wealth. But where to find it? It's a task for geologists and geophysicists. You go somewhere and look for it and find it, what we need. And here is one of the messages here, as you can see here. 60% of plant oil and gas production by 2035 will be from the fields not yet found and discovered. So people who are planning, they don't care about it, where you find it. But you have to find it, because you're paid for it. Okay? So we are looking for deep ocean or for the Arctic. There are no other resources of renewable petroleum energy. It's only those two places. So we will talk about Arctic petroleum resources. As you can see here, the four oceans, and the smallest in volume is the richest in petroleum, the Arctic. And the mean value, mean evaluation of that resources which are in, in the Arctic Ocean are approximately 264 billion tons of oil equivalent. We don't understand this number. It's too big. How big is that? We consume, during the whole history of mankind, approximately 230 billion tons of oil, and all the resources together. So the ocean has more than we consume. Of course, we are skyrocketing in consuming the, the, the resources, but still, it's, it's kind of a sizable amount. Uh, if you look at this plot, what is shown here, this is United States Geological Survey assessment of uh, most prolific zones in circumpo uh, uh, circumpolar uh, 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 part of the globe. Uh, the deepest uh, uh, green color identify the most prospective things. And the North Slope of Alaska is one of the things. And then you see western and eastern flanks of Greenland are very promising, together with Canada, and uh, the Barents Sea and the Kara Sea and the Russian Shelf, which is right there. In oil, in gas, it is more pronounced that, that Russia is very rich with the gas uh, uh, resources in the world, and probably one of the richest in the place, place in the world. 
The next slide shows how controversial are our estimates of the resources and reserved. Resources, what is given by the nature, and resources, what we can produce based on our technology, our economic assessments, uh, environmental concerns, and so on and so forth. Okay? Controversial, so this slide actually calls for collaboration and cooperation. To be united, to be similar in our assessments. This is important for the database to know how rich or how poor we are in the world. So here is the distribution of hydrocarbon resources between five nations. Here you see United States with Alaska, Canada, Denmark with Greenland, or Greenland with Denmark, whatever you prefer, Norway and Russia. And you see it happens, well, this is the independent source, Rustat Energy, Norwegian independent company. So the Russian shelf is the richest one among all of them. So, and there is a production already going on in Sakhalin Island, in Sakhalin. Then yellow color shows you late time development when you're already drilling things, but not producing yet. Uh, green, this is early time of development when we appraise the field, we already know how much is that, but we're not ready to produce it. And the blue is undiscovered potential. And be careful with this term because it's a, a probability weighted in a way. So it's multiplied by probability of finding that. So actual size could be twice as big. Here and here and here and here and here also, right? So this is a resources basis in the, in the, in, in the Arctic offshore area. Uh, we can use the same software in order to construct the, the forecast, production forecast. Again, and you can see this is very steep rise since 2030 in the Arctic development. Very steep rise, and there are four colors here identifying four nations. The blue, the light blue is Russia, and then the navy blue is Norway, and then the gray is Canada, and the black is United States. There is no Greenland here because you cannot make forecast for production, uh, production before exploration yet. So it's very promising. Greenland is very promising in terms of petroleum resources. I can tell you between us that the prospective is the most likely value, something like 50 billion barrels of oil equivalent, which is very rich. But it's not discovered yet. But you know the geology is very persistent science. They will drill unless they will find something. And this is distribution of uh, uh, resources of the Ar uh, Russian Arctic Shelf also, just to show you the picture. As you can see here, the richest one is the Kara Sea, and recent discovery made by ExxonMobil together with Rosneft just prove it, and probably it will be even greater than, uh, uh, than anticipated before. So here's the Barents Sea, no production, almost very few things, pre-resolved field. And then Laptev is Siberian Chukchi Sea, nothing, just potential. And then Sea of Okotsk, you can see production in Sakhalin Island is already going on in full speed. And this is the split between liquid and gaseous parts. Yamal, this is very small peninsula, just behind the Ural Mountains in the Asia part of Russia. So Yamal, you can translate it as I am small, but actually this is not exactly the name, but it's Yamal, but it meaning in Russian like small. But it's very small in size, but huge in resource base, as you can see here. Main resources are identified here. The polar circle goes right there. So most of them are in the Arctic, in the Arctic. So if we add the Yamal Peninsula alone to the all nations Arctic shelf development, it will increase it by 30% the total, you see? This is, oops, excuse me. No, not this one. Yes. So this is the contribution of Yamal. So together with the Arctic shells, so it can give up to 8 and even more than 8% of the total hydrocarbon production. This is potential of the Russian offshore to produce petroleum. The blue is offshore, colors, uh, offshore production and uh, uh, red or brown is onshore production in Yamal. As you can see, one of the richest places, this is Yamal alone and this is Karasi. Huge numbers. Altogether, we can produce, it's capable to produce, but, uh, 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 we're capable to produce 11 million barrels of oil equivalent per day, which is approximately 8% of the total production. So Russia is capable to produce it, but it needs cooperation. Challenges and opportunities associated with the shelf development. Uh, uh, you see there are several expeditions one of them is Franklin Expedition, very well equipped, very well equipped, 130 men on board with an excellent ship, with a food enough for two years, 
and the canned water for one year with 1,000 volumes of books to read in his spare time. No one returned home. And the other one, Goya Expedition 1911 to the South Pole, there's only five people on board. All of them reach the South Pole and return safely, and then go to the North Pole and return safely again. Amundsen Expedition. What's the difference? Mentality, respect of the Arctic. We discussed it yesterday, so I will not talk about it. You can see on this picture only four guys. There is the fifth one taking a picture. <laughs> so here is the challenges which we face. Severe climate conditions, presence of ice, high cost, long distance export to oil and gas, which brings additional heavy cost. Lack of technology, competence, and experience in offshore field development is also a very, very big issue. Deficit of qualified personnel. That's what schools and universities are trying to do their best to prepare people for the future development, exploration and development of the Arctic. Environmental risks not yet fully understood in the Arctic. Gas hydrates within the sediments of the southwestern barrens. I uh, outlined it again. It's, it's a special issue. Emergency response time, very long. And logistical issues. Tremendous difficulties. More difficulties than solution, but still we would like to go there because it's full of potential for the mankind. So here's a technical availability map uh, 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 of the uh, Russian resources. You can see the, 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 uh, the green color shows it's excellent, excellent conditions. We've got technology and uh, uh, there's very low risk to go there. Uh, 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 yellow color, it's stretched available technology to stretch a little bit in order to get it available. And then the red one, unaccessible. Arctic, too much risk associated with going there. Okay, and now uh, uh, there's a statement. Technical availability analysis of the fields in the Arctic shows that for nearly 90% of prospective fields and the proof technology, of which uh, approved technology doesn't exist. So we have to do something. We have to do something together in cooperation. Can Russia do it alone? Yes, probably yes. But it will take more time more money, and it will be not, not in, in, in a such a way that it will do it together. Not as efficient. What are the other challenges? Icebergs. As you can see, they are generated from Greenland and then from Franz Josef Land here. You can find them in the Stockman area and uh, even the southwest of that. The other challenges, gas hydrates. Gas hydrates. So if you enter, this is Stockman field. If you go through the hydrates in exploration, this is okay. But if you go through the production stage, through the hydrates, so then you produce hot gas and hot oil, so it will be melting. So the permafrost will be melting, and this gas hydrates could evolve in a gaseous phase, increasing its volume by 160 times. And if the volume is still uh, 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 inaccessible, then the pressure will build up. And sooner or later, this gas will escape, and it could be a very dangerous situation. We have to, we have to take into account those things. So if we talk about technical uh, uh, accessibility of the Arctic, so here are the things which have to take into, the, into account. And if we take all of them into account, the different estimates show that the Arctic is accessible. This is only in Barents Sea, but it's not accessible fully. It depends on the method of estimating also, but you can see they're almost the same thing, but the, 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 the level of estimates is different. So things which are fully accessible almost do not exist. It's only here. And this is stretched technology in some places. You can't go there with present technology and present understanding of the Arctic. Forget about it. Okay? Logistical issues. I'll skip that. But still, it's a long, a long thing. You see, depending on location, vessel utilization can drop down from typical 80% in normal waters to 40% in ice waters. So twice as low. And then the cost is still there. Right? Logistical and the human factor in the high north. No mistakes. And then what is highlighted by red, harmonization of training requirements in the all, all Arctic uh, uh, nations, for all, all Arctic states. So uh, Arctic states, we have to understand each other. In emergency situation, we have to behave exactly the same, to act exactly the same as one team. And this is important. Again, this is called for cooperation, definitely. Indigenous people. Someone told yesterday that we have to teach indigenous people how to behave in extraordinary situations and so on. This is a different statement here. There is a lot to learn from them because they know how to behave in extraordinary situations. They live in extraordinary, in our mind, and for them it's a nature. It's an environment. For us it's just kind of hostile, you know, some kind of different system and so on. For them they're born there. And when I was in, uh, in Inuit uh, uh, assessments, thank you very much, yes, I have to, you know, 
forget with memories or so, but I will tell you in a, in a coffee break. Okay? So these people have different mentality. One of them, just one episode. One of them said, you know, Anatoly, I got the highest, the biggest refrigerator in the world. And I started to think, what kind of Rosenlev? Uh, or maybe Saratov, this is Russian old. And I was just confused because I didn't know. What kind, I asked him. He said, the nature. <laughs> you see, this is different language. And if you understand that, you talk to them. If not, no conversation. So what is important? Environmental studies, monitoring, continuous monitoring in all the waters, not only in Russians or not only in Norwegians or not in Arctic, in Canadian or, or, or American, in all the waters together in order to get common understanding for that. I'll just a few examples here. This is the, uh, the currents, Pacific. If something happens here, I mean pollution, it will be transferred. Pollution doesn't recognize the borders, okay? It will transfer anyway. If we look at the Atlantic currents, it's here. So if something happens here, it will transmit it somewhere here. So we have to take care about that together. We cannot put just political borders between, you know, this is our and this is not our, okay? It's a nature. Exploration cost and expenditures. If you want to assist in the Russian development, you have to be ready to invest such a big amount of money. Yes, just in exploration. A development will take five times more. Five trillion dollars. Are you ready? Yesterday was a very good businessman said we got 100 billion euros to invest in the Arctic. Are you ready to do that? I mean, one trillion dollars just for exploration stage. And then you, you see your money, say, maybe in 15, 20 years after, maybe, I'm saying, if everything goes okay. Okay, so it's a big investment, but big reward. For each dollar invested in petroleum, you got $10 back. Big money. But we have to be ready for that. Now, the very last. Hatla, the very last one. Uh, collaboration in technology. This is very important. Uh, this is our opportunities. New HEC standards. Yesterday, one of the representatives of Saha Yakutia uh, region, uh, uh, Mr. Borisov, or president of Yakutia, said it's common to have temperatures minus 50, minus 60, and sometimes minus 70. International standards are developed to minus 40. What happens to the metal in minus 60? It will be brittle. You know, you can't use it. So we have to upgrade our standards together again. Not Russia alone or not for Russia, without Russia, okay? And then security of supply, we were talking about it. Pan transshipment, pan Arctic transshipment, this is very important. It's growing, yes, we, we, we noticed it, but it's still far, far away from being uh, used every day in normal uh, 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 systems. And then what I highlighted in red, education and cultural things. It's very important to get joint programs, to get students here and there. They can, they can uh, get uh, 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 the same mentality. This is the most important thing, probably, to get the same mentality, the same attitude towards the development of the Arctic, and not only the Arctic, and to develop ourselves as a society. I'll skip this one. This is a future uh, uh, <laughs> area of cooperation, I believe, but this is for the next conference. You just be patient for that. And very concluding remark, the very one. We can have a safe, secure, and reliable development of Arctic resources only through cooperation, not competition among Arctic nations. You expect that it, sh it has been said by Russian? No. It says uh, Assistant Secretary of State, Daniel Sullivan, in 2007. But I fully agree with what he said. And if we agree, if we cooperate, then, and this is the very last, in the second part of the 21st century, uh, Arctic mega basin will be as important in, 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 in hydrocarbon supply. I'm not saying energy, but hydrocarbon supply as Persian Gulf and uh, West Siberia today. And this will open us opportunities for hundreds of years ahead. As I promised, this was the very last one. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor. And now we're going to open up the mic for questions from the audience. So I encourage you to come either here on my left or on my right. So um, if we start by the, with the first question here from the left, could you please introduce yourself and yeah. keep the question straight to the point, please? I'm Pinkos Javits from Sustainability Tank. Now, uh, I appreciate the, uh, what you said in terms of the production of oil from cool regions. Uh, eventually you produce oil, you come up with a cost, and then you say that that is what you sell it for, and you assume that the consumer <coughs> buys it at that cost. What you forgot are the externalities. 
the impact of producing that oil and of using that oil. That means that the, the consumer doesn't pay only what he pays as a gas pump, but he also pays through his taxes for all kinds of health effects and so on, you know, which actually makes us very expensive. Now, to predict the Can you past, yeah, I, I'm coming straight to the question. Straight to the point, please. I'm coming to the question. To predict the past is easy. To predict the future is more difficult. Now, uh, one good prediction was Sheikh Yamani, who said that the Stone Age didn't end because of lack of stone, the oil age didn't end because of the lack of, of oil. Straight now, to the point, please. Now, my question to you is, can you put down some figure of what that oil is going to cost to the economy, not to the consumer who buys it at the pump. Thank you for a very detailed question. I will say very shortly, no, I can't. And nobody can, nobody can. Okay. But I'll tell you a story, I'm sorry for that. Do you remember how much 17 years ago the mobile phone cost? I do, I was working for Shell and we got one mobile phone which weighed 30 kilos and, and, and costed $30,000. And I could only call and nothing else. Today, everyone got something like that, or maybe two, or maybe three, it depends. Okay? We pay twice for that, but it's affordable anyway. And what you can do, you can make a picture of me and send it there, and we'll see it, how we discuss here. Can we think about it 17 years ago? Forget about it. Now we'll ask you, what will be mobile phone technology in 17 years ahead? Can you say me something? Probably you will answer the same as I did, no. You can't. We can't. And this is the beauty of this life. You know, we don't know what will happen tomorrow. Yeah, but, but, but my you. question was different. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. Um, so I will have to uh, ask you to try to find the professor here outside of the hall later on. But thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you. And uh, we move to the next session. Thank you. I'll be here after the, uh, after the session in, 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 in the room and then after, after that conference until my end of my life here also available. For <laughs> and the, 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 the electronic mail email is there, so please do that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Hatla. Thank, Thank you for excellent leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move to another issue, to the issue of climate change. Uh, we're going to see a teaser from a documentary that is in the making and that has the preliminary, preliminary title Climate Change and its Effects in the Arctic. Uh, it's by Ragnar Alexson, who's a photographer, Haraldur Sigurdsson, who's a professor, and Ingvar Snorrason, a producer. So please enjoy. <laughs> Two very different but distinguished friends, a famous volcanologist and a renowned photographer, embark on a journey to the oldest and least explored region on Earth. On this epic adventure, they unravel the enduring and puzzling mystery of the disappearance of the Viking settlers in Greenland. The result of their discovery could provide an important insight into the future of our planet.
Well, now we uh, continue uh, on the issue of climate change. And we have here a plenary session organized in collaboration between uh, Reykjavik University, Harvard University and Tufts University. And it's entitled Rising Stars, the Arctic, Climate Change and the Role of Renewable Energy. And let me start by saying how happy I am to see how many of you are here. And before I introduce uh, the panelists, I'm going to share with you the idea behind this session. Well, as we know, energy issues, climate change and Arctic affairs are closely intertwined. The more we burn fossil fuels, the more we increase climate change impact on the Arctic and the rest of the world. Education, renewable energy, infrastructure and alternative technologies are some of the tools at hand we have to transform our path to greener solutions. But while we know that we are in the cusp of transformation, for most people these solutions are still far-fetched, foreign and, and quite intangible. So how does change actually happen? How can we drive a successful implementation of innovative, greener solutions? And ultimately, how does human behavior change? Well, these are very big questions, uh, but let me explore two pieces of this bigger puzzle, uh, because I think they're important in enabling us to better adapt and adopt greener solutions. And these are, have actually been mentioned quite here today. They are culture and education. I think in order for greener solutions, we will need to ensure that cultures embrace collaboration as a norm and each culture to value our planet as a common cause. And let me explain this with a simple example uh, of a collaborative culture from farms here in Iceland, because I come from one. Uh, and, and I think it's an example that probably translates to, to many other places in the world. Given our few people in this sparsely populated country and relatively harsh and changeable weather conditions, that I know that you have experienced over this weekend. Uh, rural life in Iceland has always required everyone at its farm and neighboring farms to work together. Without this collaboration, any key task, such as haying the fields or gathering the seeps from the highlands, would be extremely difficult and everyone would lose. And therefore, there is this culture in place in these rural areas of getting the job done together. And I think the best part is that people take pride in doing so. It's considered respectful to work harder and, and contribute, not in your land, not only in your land, but also in the land of your neighbor. Um, and in climate change, we need to create this type of culture, a, a culture which appreciates and understands the longer term gains in getting the job done in collaboration. Just as on the farms, if we don't think about the long run, we will lose in the long run. We will, we will all lose eventually. But how can we actually speed up the creation of collaborative cultures for greener solutions? And this brings me to the role that education and educational institutions are playing and should continue to play. I think creating platforms which facilitate and encourage collaboration between young people rising stars, such as researchers and young professionals, in the field of energy in the Arctic is one way that we can have a multiplying effect. Hopefully such platforms can inspire new ideas, encourage education in the field, and help, or, help us transform societies to greener solutions. And of course, to get the most out of these platforms, we have to engage older and more experienced uh, mentors. So we make sure that we, we uh, utilize the lessons from the past when we implement new ones. And as a one step towards realizing this vision, the president of Iceland, Mr. Ola Ragnar Grimsson, launched the Future Arctic Energy Network last Thursday. This network, which is powered by Reykjavik University, aims to engage young experts in the field of energy and Arctic issues with a special focus on technology and innovation. It will also bring young experts to the forefront of the debate, like here at the Arctic Circle. The network welcomes participants from any country in the world, because as we've embraced at the Arctic Circle, Arctic issues are global issues. So we are pleased 
to set up this network theme by various events this weekend, including this joint session between the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, and the Iceland School of Energy at Reykjavik University. And we're especially thankful for having Dr. Muma as a speaker and a moderator of the session, because he has been a key player in the field uh, for decades and has had an impact on students and young professionals through his tireless efforts in teaching, advising and collaborating on new innovative ideas. So, I know that I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that I look forward to hearing your talks and may they inspire and spike interest for further collaboration between young people in the field. So I hereby give the floor to you, Dr. Moma. Thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and uh, I want to congratulate uh, everyone here in Iceland who has worked to make this event take place and to set up this uh, network and this collaboration. I'm going to make a few introductory remarks to set the tone, and then we'll introduce each of the, each of the participants uh, in order. Um, planetary history. Uh, the planet uh, is undergoing the greatest transformation since its emergence in the last ice age 12,000 years ago. That change in climate then allowed for the rise of agriculture and the formation of cities. The benign period of climate known as the Hol Holocene has supported the current human population of just over seven billion people. Now each generation has a set of tasks before it. The, ta the generation uh, before uh, mine uh, found ways to reduce infectious disease and reduce human misery, and it was accomplished by that generation. The cleaning of air and water in the developed world and halting the use of ozone-depleting chemicals was the accomplishment of my generation, but there is unfinished business. Saving the climate, our oceans, and biodiversity by halting the release of heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere from fossil fuels and land use changes falls to you, the younger generation. Let's just take a look at this planetary history. This is the temperature uh, going back to the year 1000, about the time that uh, Iceland was founded by, by Vikings. And you can see it goes up and it goes down, uh, and it keeps going. And then at the very end, there's this dramatic rise in temperature. That's what we have done uh, through our um, release of gases into the atmosphere. If we go back for, for earlier history, uh, 800,000 years. I don't even know if that's history. It's only history if it's human, and humans have only been here for 200,000 years. So this is prehistory on here as well. Um, you can see that it has gone up and down, temperature has gone up and down, and carbon dioxide has gone up and down pretty much in sync with that. That's the result of planetary motions long before we were here. Notice the green line on the very right-hand side. That line, which ends actually below where we are now, we're actually at 400 parts per million is the amount of carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere today. But has the climate changed? Well, according to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, September 2014 was the warmest global September since records began in 1880. It was the 38th consecutive September with a global temperature above the 20th century average. And that means that anyone who was born after 1976 has never experienced a September that was cooler than the average September of the 20th century. It just keeps going up. And of course, as you know, the ice keeps melting. It's pretty clear dramatic things have happened in recent years in terms of the loss of Arctic sea ice. This is just showing in the year 2012, which is the most dramatic, when about half of the Arctic sea ice that would, would have been there uh, during the average from 1979 to 2000 disappeared. And in 2009, the first two ships actually made the transit through the Arctic. And that really whetted everyone's appetite to go and do Arctic drilling. There's oil and gas, as you just heard from the previous speaker. There is a lot of it. However, this morning, or today, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released the last uh, part of its um, fifth assessment report, the so-called synthesis report. And let me just quote a take a couple of quotations from it. 
The synthesis report offers conclusive scientific evidence that human activities continue to cause unprecedented changes in the Earth's climate, with the conclusion that we need to elevate the level of political commitment and action if we are to avoid the impacts of climate change. I might also add the World Bank has published three reports now saying that every bit of development that the World Bank has financed since the end of the Second World War when it was founded will be wiped out if the temperatures rise by four degrees Celsius, which is the trajectory we're actually on. So um, uh, the, the executive director of UNEP, Occam Steiner, is quoted as, about the latest report saying, the latest IPCC report has provided us with not only the latest climate science and data, but also with a better understanding of the best options for action. The IPCC thus represents the foundation and a compass for the negotiations in Lima in next month and uh, in Paris in 2015. So basically the findings are we can still limit global warming to two degrees C and thus avert the worst consequences for our children and future generations. That's a direct quote from the report. However, to ex avoid exceeding that, the remaining budget of carbon dioxide is 900 billion tons. And if annual emissions today are about 30 billion tons, so we have 30 years at current emission rates. As you saw in the previous talk, there is a lot more out there than that. Uh, two years ago, some colleagues and I took a look at these data and we came up with this situation. We estimated not 900, but 1,050 billion tons. That's uh, actually three years ago, so it's fairly, fairly close to these numbers. But look at how much oil we know, the blue line, how much gas we know we have, how much coal we know we have. We can only do what's in that bottom bar and stay within two degrees. So the question is whether we will actually need all that oil or should use all that oil. Um, there have been studies that suggest it's technologically feasible to shift from uh, fossil fuels, there on the left, the black areas, to a variety of renewables sometime in the next, uh, by, by 2050 or so. This is an interesting study, and um, there's no technological barrier. There are um, basically implementation barriers. But people are not waiting. This new a uh, skyscraper in Manhattan is considered the world's most sustainable commercial building. It was completed in 2013. Extraordinary low energy use, very little use of fossil fuels in any way. Um, my own home, 10 years ago, my wife and I decided we wanted to have a fossil fuel free home. Is that possible in New England where the winter temperatures get down to minus 10 Celsius? And the answer is yes. It's possible, and we've been doing it since 2007 when we moved in. And wanting to go one step further, uh, added a few solar panels last year, bought a uh, plug-in uh, hybrid car, and I can now drive, at least in town, on solar electricity. Truly carbon-free. We're connected to the grid, and I actually purchase renewably generated when I'm buying from the grid, and I sell to the grid, and I produce more than I use. But that's not the only way. Volkswagen last year came out with this vehicle <clears throat> that can go 110 kilometers on a single liter of fuel. So you don't have to go all, all electric, you can actually go this way, or if you want, you can get uh, an, uh, uh, some other fancy electric vehicle. So here are two views and one conclusion. An altered climate is expected to reduce GDP of the world by five to 25% each year, according to Nicholas Stern, Sir Nicholas Stern. And the co-chair of uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says it doesn't cost the Earth to save the planet. He's also an economist. But it can be done. Since the 2011 IPCC report on renewable energy that I worked on, we've more than doubled the amount of wind and solar in the world, in China, the US, and Europe. Energy efficiency gains have made great strides. China is implementing carbon prices in addition to Europe, Northeast US states, Quebec, British Columbia, and California and the current generation of rising stars will write the next chapter of planetary history. The future of human society will be determined on how society treats the planet, and the current generation of rising stars has already shown that they can break out of some of the destructive development patterns. So we of the passing generation, I want to assure you, will do what we can to help. Thank you.
thank you, Dr. Moma. So the next speaker we have is Mr. Samuel Perkin, who is a PhD candidate at Landsnet and Reykjavik University. He's going to talk about Greenland's stranded energy. The floor is yours. Dear President Grimson, distinguished guests and undistinguished guests, it's a pleasure to speak to you today on this grand occasion. Um, I, I was talking to a friend of mine a few days ago about the title of this session, Rising Stars in Renewable Energy, and that I was a bit reluctant to oversell myself as a rising star. And my, my friend assured me that there are trillions of stars that rise and fall every night. So with that humble context, let me speak to you today about renewable energy. Um, I'm going to speak specifically about Greenland's stranded energy, so the renewable energy potential they have and the ways they can utilize it, given that it's so remote compared to the demand centers around the, around the world. So I'll, I'll start with hydropower. There was a report generated in the late 1970s by an Austrian researcher called Partl who estimated that the upper limit of hydropower generation in Greenland is approximately 800 terawatt hours per year. This is roughly equivalent to the electricity demand of Germany, or seeing as we're in Iceland, it's roughly 50 Icelands. Um, this figure is quoted quite often in both literature and in news articles. So I just wanted to spend a moment discussing how this figure came about. Uh, this Austrian researcher, he calculated how much solar radiation was absorbed by the, uh, the Greenlandic ice sheet over the course of a year and how much meltwater this would generate. And he assumed that this would be available for hydropower generation at a height of approximately 1,000 meters, which I think is, it, it was the average elevation of the Icelandic, I mean, the Greenlandic ice sheet at the time. Um, I was trying to think of an interesting way to explain why I think this is a disingenuous estimate. And so here is a, a picture of my childhood house, not to compare houses with Muma. <laughs> but uh, I, I, as, as you can imagine, hydropower in Australia is not so prevalent, but instead we need water for consumption, for drinking and washing and gardening. Um, as you see on my house, there's uh, these gutters that we install on every slope of our roofs, and we, we try and capture every single drop that falls so that we, we can avoid using uh, precious aquifer water or using expensive desalination plants. If, in order to achieve this 800 terawatt per hour, terawatt hour per year um, limit, we would need to effectively treat the Greenlandic ice sheet as Australians treat their roofs. We would need to skirt the entire ice sheet with a gutter system to capture every drop in order to achieve this limit. It's, to me, it's, a, it's similar to this, this figure that's often quoted that one hour of solar power, or one, one hour of solar radiation on the planet is enough to produce enough electricity for the entire human race for a year. Um, it's, not technically wrong, but it sets the bar far too high and it's an unrealistic starting point when discussing renewable energy. So let me talk about more the, the lower practical limit to hydropower in Greenland. There was a report done nine years ago by Nuke Sorfit, which is the national uh, owner of hydropower in Greenland. And they identified that there's 65 potential sites for development which add up to 16 terawatt hours per year, which is 2% of the upper limit I showed you previously. And so this is what we could achieve today, what they are looking into, and all of these projects are at various stages in development. And as you notice, this, this figure shows the distribution of how large these potential plants are. And you'll see that the majority are small. There's a few large ones above 100 megawatts, and of these 600 megawatts are already kind of put aside for a, an Alcoa aluminium smelting plant. But it's still to be seen whether that will be developed. So there's a, there's a, big, um, there's a big uncertainty here between 16 and 800 terawatt hours per year. And it, 
it suggests that there's a lot of research that we can still do and that there's a, maybe we should show some restraint in developing it because we're not entirely certain of what exists in Greenland. And now I'll shift the topic to uh, offshore wind power. This figure comes from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who so used a, a satellite to beam down microwave pulses and using the reflectivity of this pulse from the ocean, they could measure the wind speed because as you know from this morning, the greater the wind speed, the more rough oceans get. And of course that scatters the, uh, the pulse. So you can use that to measure uh, wind speeds with some degree of accuracy. And these two figures behind me, they, uh, they show that there are considerable offshore wind resources in Greenland, uh, specifically in the winter, which may not be the time that people are working in Greenland, but it, they are still considerable. And even in the, northern, in the summer, in the Northern Hemisphere, there's still considerable resources on the southern tip of Greenland. So there, there is potential there, but it's harder to discuss practical limits because there are many, you can build as many wind turbines as you want as there are spaces on the planet. So it's, uh, it's more the demand that drives wind power development. And so the hydro and wind power are kind of the two main uh, sources of renewable energy available to Greenland. The tidal power also exists, but if you're not developing cheap hydropower, it's unlikely that you will be considering the development of tidal power. So let me shift to how Greenland can use their renewable energy. The three kind of basic options are that they can aim to export it to the North American continent or the European continent. They can try and encourage local growth in energy intensive industry through mining and aluminium smelting, or they can wait. So I'll just touch briefly on each of these three options. So the, the map behind me shows a simplistic view of where these cables would run based on the, uh, the depth of the ocean floor. The, in the North American case, the shale gas boom has driven electricity prices so low that uh, hydropower plants in Quebec, which are connected to the northeastern uh, American grid, are going underutilized. So it's unlikely that if Canadian hydropower isn't being used, that they would want to use a Greenlandic hydropower plant. And the same goes for the UK. Um, we're considering this Icelandic link. And of course, linking to Iceland will always be cheaper than Greenland. So until that happens in the next 10 years, it's not worth considering this cable. So this option can be written off for the next decade or so. There are estimates that Greenland has quite substantial mineral deposits, and there is a drive to develop these deposits, Thank you. and to use local energy in order to extract these. But a report by the Brookings Institute, which came out recently, suggests that it's unlikely any of these developments will take place within the next 10 years. Um, so that brings me to my last option. And I think this, this option hasn't really been given enough weight in this conference, that the most sustainable form of development is to not develop. And we need to, I'm not saying we should not develop at all, but we need to keep this option on the table for most, uh, most things that we discuss. As, as one of the speakers said in the, uh, the Inuit session, the Arctic is doing fine as it is, and we need to make sure that 100 years from now, we're not apologizing to the communities that live there now because we rushed in and we developed because it seemed like a great way to get a short-term gain without considering the long-term consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So now we move uh, from Greenland to India, and our next speaker is Kartikeya Singh. Here we go. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand here today. It is an honor to be here and speak to you all 
I come to you as a true global citizen, a native of India. This is my ancestral home, since we're carrying on with the theme of homes. Actually, it was not coordinated. Uh, and until about three years ago, we didn't have electricity access, so zero carbon. Uh, and not to compete, once again. <laughs> as an American national uh, who immigrated to the United States when I was uh, about eight years old, and one who has negotiated on behalf of small island nations at the UN climate negotiations. And after arriving here um, in this high northern place, somebody who is more sensitized um, to the fate of the Arctic. It is only when one has the opportunity to arrive to the edge of the world or what somebody from where I come from, what this seems like the edge but probably is not to the people who live here, um, one is able to make those connections. And while a presentation uh, that is focused on a geography that is thousands of miles away may seem unusual at such a gathering, it has been said several times throughout this conference that what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And similarly, what 1.2 billion people in India do has an impact far and wide, including right here in the Arctic. And while India slowly but surely attempts to reignite its long-standing relationship with the Arctic that established by signing the Svalbard Treaty in 1920, perhaps the lessons of how India provides electricity to 400 million people without electricity access can foster cooperation. And cooperation not just between countries of the Global South, but between countries of the Global South and those of the North and the High North. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality is that we will be living in a high energy planet for the decades to come. 1.6 billion people do not have access to electricity and 2.6 billion people still burn biomass for cooking, the impacts of which will be felt here in the Arctic. For too long, the debate on climate change has neglected to envision what bringing these people who currently live in energy poverty out will, uh, and, and provide them with genuine energy access for thriving and not simply surviving um, will, will be like in a, in a climate constrained world. The markets and cultures may be diverse, uh, but unpacking the factors is very important to study how diffusion and, and scaling of low carbon technologies needs to take place in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And the truth is, under current scenarios, India cannot help the world achieve a two degree target that we heard about this morning in the fight against climate change. Um, what you're seeing here to the left is a graph of, um, of one of the largest sort of energy planning exercises undertaken by the government of India um, of the various different energy scenarios and the mixes um, that are being planned. And what you're seeing on the right is the impact in terms of carbon dioxide of these various scenarios. And the scenarios stretch from oil and coal heavy to the most renewable intensive. And a simple exercise of of carbon budgets and what India would need to do in order to achieve a two degree target would place its emissions where you see that orange bar and it is nearly half, uh, less than half of what each one of those current scenarios presents. And the reason this is so is because India needs to expand its energy access. 400 million people, as I said, do not have access to electricity. 70% of the population burns biomass for cooking. And 40% of Himalayan glacier melt, and this has an incredible localized impact, um, is happening as a result of black carbon emissions from the particulates. Um, the 650 million Indians who were lucky to get electricity access in the last three decades are responsible for up to 25% of India's growth in carbon dioxide emissions. And, and we know that as 400 million more Indians are provided access, India is going to need to focus on the sector in order to continue to reduce poverty. So while India may not be able to handle a scenario of strictly allocated carbon budgets, what it can do is provide an understanding of how one rapidly deploys low carbon technologies. And this is what I'm hoping to do through my work. And I've just returned from India, um, and it's been an exciting time studying the innovation in the energy access space. The map you see behind you is a foolish attempt to capture data from around the country, both through field visits and interviews. Um, to study how this innovation is taking place. It's an annual market of $2 billion in the off-grid energy space. Um, and while the government is still going to look at some centralized options uh, for solutions to energy access, about 20,000 remote villages will have to rely solely on renewable energy and decentralized um, energy systems. So the lessons are incredibly important. 
And some of what I've been doing um, is studying how effective the government has been in diffusing low carbon, uh, diffusing off-grid solar technologies. Um, the green dots are respondents of surveys of authorized solar retailers uh, that chose to actually participate in my study. The rest either complained or yelled at me. Um, but what I managed to extract was really interesting because it, it throws into question some of the data that we know exists about how much solar already is on the ground in India. Um, and some of these figures already question um, what the IEA has put out there in terms of off-grid solar products being deployed in India. This is um, uh, an underestimate and would blow some of the figures from the IEA um, out of proportion. Uh, and this is just a more formalized market. There are a large number of innovations happening um, across the country in the informal sector. People like this gentleman in the Sundarbans, which is the mangrove forest uh, area in the border between India and Bangladesh, which will have some incredible impacts and will be closely tied to the Arctic, are picking out products and creating their own off-grid solar systems to power everything in their home, including satellite television. And um, you know, he has access to the Real Housewives of, of Miami, probably, um, and, and doesn't know what, what he's watching, perhaps. Um, but. There are um, people that are figuring out innovative packages for selling solar technologies. And some of the things that I'm finding, and the reason um, I'd like to call them observations, because they are observations at this point, I'm hoping to continue unpacking them, is that it is a business of leads. When we're talking about a decentralized market, everybody is a player. And the different key players that I'm meeting are, are pointing directions in middlemen and people who are taking a cut of the profits. But if that's what it takes to get solar on the ground and diffuse and play in this market, perhaps that's something that we need to look at as investors and innovators. There are complex networks at play um, in in, in distribution of solar. Uh, if you know anything about Amway in the United States or ways, innovative ways that companies are selling makeup where you make money off of selling products, it's also being translated into the world of solar, uh, as is the example with this company, which has seen record profits in just the last two years in, the, in sales in the state of Bihar um, through their intricate network for diffusing solar. And once again, because it is an academic study, I'm looking at diffusion and the impact that word of mouth has on diffusion. So each bubble sort of represents an individual that told somebody else and influenced other people to make purchases in solar. Um, and it's incredible to see how this plays out in rural India. Um, some questions that come up in this process is financing for whom? Do we have a false sense of how poor people save? Quite perhaps because I was finding innovative ways that people were managing to save and had the purchasing power uh, to, to purchase solar products. And of course, the prices are also coming down. And the reasons for purchasing are also different. With low cost appliances coming online, it's further diffusing the products. I'm getting the music here. Uh, and perhaps the most important thing is that people like this gentleman are getting simple training to create entire kits of off-grid solar lighting systems to be able to sell. And they're far outstripping uh, some of the more well-known business plan competition winning companies that we hear about. And perhaps it's time to look at how we can strengthen these networks of people we might not consider um, very educated, but who are fully capable and embedded in the ecosystems. Ecosystems which are so important to sustain a product and a technology like this in the field. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say that it's important to bridge the gap in dialogue and policy between climate change and energy access for a more secure environment in the Arctic. The solutions to address energy access will be centralized as well as decentralized, and some of those solutions include geothermal and microhydro. And uh, understanding diffusion patterns for technology and the ecosystems in which they are deployed is critical to scaling up of low-carbon technologies. In my short time here, I have managed to venture out beyond the city and catch a glimpse of what rural Iceland looks like. Scattered homes, sometimes miles apart, small communities, lone lights amidst a sea of darkness at night. This is not unfamiliar uh, scene to the part of India from which I come. The challenge there, however, is that decades of underdevelopment, missed opportunities, and playing politics with power. But as India awakens to a renewed mission of fulfilling this promise of power, it will serve as a test bed for humanity on how low carbon um, technologies can be diffused for the base of the pyramid and remote communities around the world. As we are bound together in facing this challenge, we are also bound together in finding the solutions. Thank you. Thank you. And then next we have uh, Trisha Srum from the Harvard Kennedy School. And I guess we're all looking forward to see her childhood home. <laughs> Thank you. And I hate to disappoint, I did not bring a picture of my childhood home. 
it's not zero carbon either. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is the idea of building support um, for Arctic renewable energy and other climate change mitigation options, and thinking about that from the perspective of behavioral science. So first, I'm going to try to convince you why we need behavioral science to inform um, this discussion. And then I'm just going to take a couple um, items out of behavioral science and discuss those briefly, um, and hopefully before I get kicked off the stage uh, for going over time. Um, so first of all, this is a beautiful vista of offshore wind energy. Uh, the problem is that it's going to be expensive. Right now, um, you know, recent studies show that it's going to require substantial subsidies. Once again, we have a lot of potential for distributed renewable generations, but that's also going to require some uh, additional support um, in order to be competitive with uh, fossil fuel technologies. And finally, to really scale up renewable energy in the Arctic, we're definitely going to need grid expansion and possibly energy storage to other costly solutions. So not to be too negative or anything, but we're going to need something um, in order to make these things competitive. We need a carbon price, government subsidies, or a higher willingness to pay for renewable energies. Um, these are going to require a substantial commitment uh, for, for climate change mitigation. So that's easy, right? All you do is we show people these graphs of how terrible the world will be if we do nothing, and they will just fork over the cash no problem. Walk away. We're set. Right? Well, it, it, it's not quite that easy, or so it has seemed over the past number of decades that we've been working on this problem. We're starting to get people to take climate change seriously. It's being seen as a top priority in a number of countries across, across uh, the world. We can talk about the United States later with their 40%. Um, but there's still wide disparities in how much people are willing to pay to address climate change. So what does behavioral science have to, tell, have, to, have to say about this issue? Like clearly, we have this disconnect between the information, you know, the weight of the problem, and the willingness to really step up and um, put forth the necessary resources for the solutions. And I just want to say that, first of all, we really need to stop and appreciate um, how complicated climate change is. It's an extremely takes an extremely daunting cognitive effort just to wrap your head around the problem. And that makes it particularly conducive to issues um, that come up when we have limited, um, limited information, limited cognitive capacity, limited time, and judging by the number of people checking their emails right now, limited attention. Um, so as a result, we, we really we take a lot of shortcuts. Uh, we have biases. We use rule of thumb thinking. Um, and we don't always optimize. So behavioral economics is working to try to figure out how to better connect people um, with the information and, with, and to better design policies that are going to help uh, motivate people to take action or at least behave optimally. And you know, we've already seen from the other talks, sometimes optimal, you know, we can discuss what's, what's optimal and what's not, but we want to make sure that we can get us to that point uh, once we have an idea of what we should be doing. So lesson number two is that, that framing matters. Um, frames are, you can think of a frame as an interpretive storyline that set a specific train of thought into motion. Um, and it's communicating you know, why something might be a problem. People are going to make vastly different decisions um, depending on how a situation is framed. Now, here's a couple different frames that we can use uh, to connect more people to the problems of climate change and the solutions. We can, the economic development frame has been, has been very popularly used in the past couple years and, and it seems, seems to be effective. Technology development, nostalgia, you know, think about never having a white Christmas again. That, that'll, that appeals to people and they can feel that in a way that they have trouble connecting with graphs and numbers. Um, private property is a good uh, way of thinking of appealing to a more conservative set um, mindset and also thinking about safety and insurance. So people have a diverse set of experiences and viewpoints. So we should expect a diverse response to the same information. It's not enough to simply put your research out there um, and expect it to be um, understood and incorporated into people's behavior. 
So the, the third lesson I want to draw from behavioral science is the idea of time inconsistency and hyperbolic discounting. Um, so in climate models, when we're trying to inform how big of a carbon tax we should, we should have or which policy options are viable or how much we should really be doing, um, the social cost of carbon is extremely sensitive to the discount rate used in the analytical model. Um, and the disagreement over whether that rate should be 3% or 5% or even 7%, 1%, zero, uh, leads to huge ranges of estimates in the social cost of carbon. This adds to the uncertainty um, and kind of provides fuel for the fire of um, people who, who want to delay action due to uncertainty, whether um, for um, legitimate or less legitimate reasons. Um, so behavioral science suggests a different approach. So we'll do a quick audience participation here. Um, would you rather have $10 in cash right now, or would you rather have $15 next week? Who says $10 right now? Oh, you guys are very savers. Uh, $15 next week? Wow, man, this is a different crowd, because I'll tell you, the studies that have been done have shown that to be very flipped. So you guys are all very future-minded. I guess it's not that surprising. Um, so if you said $10 today, then you're exhibiting a high discount rate. Uh, would you have, rather have $10 in five weeks or $15 in six weeks? Who would rather have $10 in five weeks? $15 in six weeks. OK, so even, um, even though you guys are very future-minded, um, we saw some switches from the first scenario to the second scenario. If we had a constant discount rate, we wouldn't see that switching. So we're showing time inconsistency. What that leads us to is the idea of hyperbolic discounting. It captures this inconsistency, and it's more appropriate for long-term problems. Uh, so immediate benefits are still more valuable than uh, benefits in the future under hyperbolic discounting. Here we have the blue line represents um, hyperbolic discounting. And we have um, the green line is just your regular you know, exponential or compound discounting. Um, and benefits don't um, decay so quickly to zero. So basically, with hyperbolic discounting, it better represents the idea that we still can care about the far future, even if we care a little bit more about what happens today than what happens tomorrow. Um, so this has a huge impact on the estimates of social cost of carbon, which is something we should care about um, when we're thinking about communicating the level of uncertainty and the level of action we should be taking today versus tomorrow. And I've got my concluding thoughts right in time. Um, almost. So in conclusion, with our current technology, renewable energy is going to require some additional public support. Hopefully we'll see the sort of technological, technological developments that are going to bring down those costs in short order, and it'll soon be cost competitive with fossil fuel technologies. But in the meantime, we're probably going to require some subsidies or a carbon tax. Um, now, in order to build public support to pay these higher prices, we need to understand how people are actually processing the information that we're giving them about climate change and using that information to make their decisions, whether it's you know, whether to install more energy efficient technology or whether it's to vote for the guy who's saying that we want to put um, wind power as a top priority. Um, and I think that we can take lessons away as practitioners and policymakers. Uh, we can already incorporate the many things in behavioral science um, that helps us uh, behave or helps us build better policies or communicate better with our constituents. Um, and additionally, much, much more research is needed um, to understand how to apply these concepts um, to climate change and renewable energy. I hope to be um, generating some of that re research in the future, and I hope to get some collaboration um, from people in this room um, on these very important questions. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. Now we move to our last speaker, uh, Xiu Liu. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here. As I've learned a lot 
about the climate change is some kind of a great challenge facing the human beings. It's not just one country's challenge. It's not raised by one country. It's a challenge facing our world. But I should point out is that this challenge is especially the challenge for the developing countries, especially the challenge for the countries that most vulnerable for the climate change, like Iceland, like the Arctic countries. Here I will present some kind of uh, basic ideas, information, learnings, and experience of China's, uh, what China do in response to climate change, and the challenge of China's face, and uh, the, some kind of opportunities China have. I hope this information can provide you some good experience or insights to uh, helping us dealing with our climate issue. When we talk about China, we actually talk about a country that has a very, very big scales. Its population is 1.4 billion. And I should note that in terms of manufacturing perspective, China is already the number one in most kinds of uh, manufacturing products. If we calculate just uh, the China as a loan for its production of steel, cement, coke, and glass, it's already more than half of the global total, which means China alone is larger than the rest of the world. And you can see here, in terms of the carbon emission, which is a major greenhouse gas uh, emissions, that's, uh, how to say, the major contributor of the climate change, we can see they have the very, very fast, okay, yeah, the point, very fast increase of China's carbon emission. That's just past the US in 2007. Now the total amount of China's CO2 emission is already equal to the total emission that US and EU get together. And if we divide this emission into the, like the year by year, we calculate how much emission that you increased in each year. This figure shows that if we calculate this, you can see that China total contribution is almost equal, uh, equal to the 70% of the new increase emission in just one year. And in India contribute another like the 20%. If we added China and India together, we actually have the total new increase emission every year. This is because the major developed countries like US and other countries they already decrease their total emission. And what's the most important thing is if we look at this emission by the per person terms, like the per capita, this is my, uh, one of the very fresh research I and my uh, colleagues we just uh, su submitted last week into the Nature Climate Change. We calculate the every person's carbon footprint, which means we added all of the carbon emission into your individual activities, like the how much emission related to your house, how much of the emission related to your cars, related to your food. We added this up and we calculate all of the world. You can see that at average China's value is very low, and this is average world value, and all, all, also some kind of other major developing countries. They are comparatively in, in a very low value. But if we disaggregate China's population, depends on their income groups. Here is the, like the, uh, in total 13 income groups. And here is the people lived in rural areas. Here is the people lived in urban areas. Here you can see that this is the most richest Chinese. What's their per capita carbon footprint is already equal to the level like the UK or even like the higher than Japan. The point is, we know that they have the four million people lived in Arctic uh, cycles or the neighbor countries. But for China, every year, they have 14, more than 14 million people that from the rural area coming to the city to become the citizens in the urban area. So this means that per capita emission will increase very fast as the transition. 
and China uh, adopted the uh, climate policy, like to reduce the per capita intensity. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, not per capita, to reduce the carbon intensity, and as an indicator, and located these intensity indicators into the regions. You can see that this indicator into different regions. China used this indicator as a, some kind of a criteria to judge the performance of the local officers. If, so if the local officer failed to meet this target, then there will be like the effect their promotion opportunity. What's this, uh, what's the kind of effect of this strategy? You can see that among the history, among the China's history, like the China adopted this strategy into the five-year plan, and th this actually performed very well. You can see the fourth decrease of the intensity, except this one, because they have the no target, no such kind of a target has been allocated. But China performed this target by closing the low efficient small factories and build a very large capacity of the new, like the power generation factories. And the total effect of the close of no efficient factory, the capacity of the production could equal to the total production in UK. Here is a, just a figure to show how the effect, actually we shouldn't acknowledge that con China contribute a lot of the uh, emission reduction. The value of China's close of the uh, emission is much larger than the total emission reduction that has been achieved by the total developed countries in, since the sign of the Kyoto Protocol. And what's the real challenge for China's facing is if we calculate the trajectory as a business as usual and the, the scenarios that we need to control China's emission into two degree, you can actually calculate the, how much of the areas that is the emission we need to reduce. These areas, the, the, the area we calculate how much the emission equivalent to is equivalent to the emission that we have been produced in, in, the, in the whole world. We have been produced. So this is what we require to reduce. And we have the, like the administrative measures for the emission reduction, but we need uh, some more actions like market mechanism, like policy innovation and uh, some kind of financial ends. Through this, we can achieve the low carbon development for China. I should point out, I have no, no time for further introduce this part, but the opportunity is also huge. If we, uh, if we can just uh, look at the renewable energy, the scale of the, uh, how much of the market that can be provided by the renewable energy, it's actually just for the Cape and the trade carbon system the scale is already equal to the total oil market right now. And by 2020, this market system can be doubled their scale. So this is kind of also create a lot of uh, opportunity for China and for the world. Thank you. Well. We've learned about the many of challenges and opportunities about implementing renewable energy in different parts of the world. And now Dr. Muma is going to lead discussions. And Sam, I can assure you that you're one amongst the rising stars here. So please participate. <laughs> yes, fortunately, we have some time for uh, questions. And uh, you've seen, uh, I think it's really a, water, a really a striking contrast between the scale of India and China and the scale of Iceland. It is such a different situation, and of course, levels of development, very, very different. And attitudes, as you heard, very different in different countries. And um, even the way we do the calculations, as we saw in Greenland, make a big difference in terms of our perception of what is possible. So let me, let me just throw this open, and uh, as, uh, we'll just uh, start right here with the first question, Hi. please. Um, my name's Gemma Lord from the Glasgow School of Art. Um, this summer, I was lucky enough to travel to Inner Mongolia, where I saw the rare earth mineral mines, uh, where they produce magnets for things like wind turbines and so-called eco cars. Um, and it seems to me like the West, by using renewable energy, is simply shifting its carbon production over to eastern countries. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this and how we can maybe take more responsibility for so-called renewable energy. 
Do you want to answer that? Yeah, yeah take, there's a microphone right there. Yes? Just, just okay. Speaking. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I think this kind of a shift of the manufacturing is kind of a normal, uh, uh, how to say, the normal uh, status, like the, because of the legal bulk cost in China is cheap, and most of the world countries' uh, factories located in uh, China. But the important thing is how China can, or maybe the rest of the world, can really use such kind of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Like we have the very high capacity of wind power in China, but the really use of the electricity generation that being produced in wind power is maybe just a half. Most of the kind of uh, wind farm is not operate in there like the Euro state. Yes, uh, here please. Hi, my name is Joel Heath. I'm the Canada Fulbright Chair in Arctic Studies. And uh, my question is kind of about the storage and distribution side of things. So it seems like different places have their different challenges and opportunities for production. Uh, I work up in Hudson Bay. Um, an eighth of the water that goes into Hudson Bay, sorry, uh, the fresh water, an eighth of the fresh water that goes from rivers into the Arctic Ocean is behind hydroelectric dams in Hudson Bay. And our issue is that that peaks in the middle of winter when everyone turns up their thermostats down south, reversing the hydrological cycle. So we're wondering about hydro, our friend who's next up over there asked yesterday about where is hydrogen fuel for Arctic shipping? Arctic shipping being something that peaks in the spring instead of winter. So we're, we're wondering what sort of opportunities there might be for hydrogen fuel to, for Arctic shipping, um, for distributing an abundance of electricity in a place like Iceland. I'm going to visit uh, one of the first ships that was ever powered on hydrogen fuel from a hydroelectric dam here in Iceland. And so I'm wondering what um, you think the potential is for hydrogen as a way to help with this. Do we have any hydrogen ex experts here? Uh, I, I looked at this a number of years ago a little bit, and actually a, uh, an Icelandic student of mine who was uh, studying uh, did his uh, master's thesis, so this is a little bit out of date. But a number of years ago, there was a lot of discussion in Iceland about uh, using uh, the renewable energy here to make hydrogen. Uh, for the fishing fleet, uh, for perhaps automobiles, it was a time when uh, fuel cells were thought to be just around the corner. Um, apparently, there are a couple of auto companies that will come out with them in the next year or two. Um, it's certainly a possibility. It's a, it, it is, as you know, uh, electrolysis is a pretty uh, um, electricity expensive um, way to make, make hydrogen, but it certainly can be done. And if the, if the um, cost of, of uh, developing the renewable resource is low, then I don't see any reason why it couldn't be done that way. But uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear that there is actually a ship that's designed to uh, use hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, not as a fuel, sorry. Pardon? Not as a fuel. You're talking to one of the experts on hydrogen in Iceland, sorry. Right. Uh, it was not used as a fuel. It was used for the auxiliary power unit. Ah. And uh, just to get it right, the efficiency, the energy efficiency of electro electrolysis is about 65 to 75 percent. And that's much, much higher than the normal uh, car engine. So it is possible and it's feasible. It is much, much higher energy efficiency because it, you don't lose so much to heat. But that were, I was not going to ask questions about that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just coming in. All right. I can just say one thing, that all the, a lot of the water coming down is right on, in Labrador they're building new dams, Quebec, British Columbia on both sides of the Northwest Passage. So I'm wondering how this sort of policy for Arctic shipping, if it was on hydrogen fuel, uh, would help reduce black carbon, yeah. what sort of, how we might incorporate this into the polar code, for mm. example. Well, I do, as a chemist, I do know hydrogen burns very cleanly, so they would really reduce black carbon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, no. I, I miss uh, delegates from Greenland this year, but last year it was emphasized again and again how infrastructure is really needed in the Arctic area for the people that live there. And that's why I, the, the, the essay on Greenland and the hydropower in there was a huge disappointment when you, when you said do nothing, because there, were, there are, a, are a number of possibilities to do small hydro plants for <coughs> the inhabitants in, for example, Greenland. And they are actually now using diesel power, which is both gives off a lot of sooth and is extremely expensive. So I would like you to add uh, some comments on local 
infrastructure of grid energy systems for people that live in these remote areas using renewable energy. Thank you. No, th thank you. I think that's a, it's a great comment that uh, we definitely need to look at what the local communities need and what we can do for them. And I, I think these, the situation in Greenland lends itself to these small-scale hydro for the communities rather than big-scale hydro for mining. I, I think what you said is perfect. I, I have no more comment but than to just agree with it. Exactly. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Caitlin, and I'm studying environmental science at University of British Columbia. I just have one question. Um, it was actually for the last session, but I didn't get to ask it. Um, why is it that we need more oil? I have worked in northern Alberta, and I have been in a mining pit. And I have seen things that supposedly don't happen in the oil industry. And I have really, really tried to understand this a need for oil that just, just seems so absolutely necessary. Um, for my question, though, I prefer not to have a response, but for everyone to just ask themselves, do we really need more oil? If the answer is yes, then perhaps we should reevaluate our priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. He Hello, uh, Dr. Demine de Georges. I'm a Reykjavik-based consultant. Just to comment on Samuel's informative uh, presentation on Greenland and its potential. As you come from Australia, I remember the launch some years ago of an Australian-Chinese joint venture in the green energy called Oz China. And uh, given the potential of Greenland already with its name, Greenland, this is definitely a sector where Greenland uh, could, uh, could further look at in terms of attracting foreign investments. Maybe one day after China, you will see a Greenlandic Chinese joint venture called Green China. At least what is for sure is that global green growth will need great Greenland's potential, not only renewable, but also its rare earth to, to secure green technologies. And that the Greenland ice cap will need global green growth to remain as beautiful as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Time for just one last quick question. Uh, thank you. My name is um, Mark Lantain from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. I just have a quick question for Professor Zhu. Um, since the beginning of the year, the Chinese government has been um, following a renewed push against pollution, and there is uh, a great deal of pressure not only to uh, work on green solutions to China's energy needs, but also to diversify the um, number of energy sources for China. Uh, I was just wondering if you can comment on how these two roles, the idea of green technology and the idea of diversifying uh, China's energy needs away from traditional coal, are compatible with each other and how the Arctic might play a role. Hydrogen was mentioned, but another option could be, uh, for example, thermal energy. Uh, it's, uh, like the, thank you for the question. And I think uh, this is very interesting and important issue, like the how much China, the energy China need, and how much that energy can be supplied by the renewable or nuclear. As we know that the capacity of the renewable energy in China is increased in the rate that is fast in the world. Every year, they build uh, like the new renewable energy, the capacity will be like 30% higher than the previous year. But this cannot meet the China's energy demand because China's energy is basically 75% of the energy demand is by coal. If we need to replace this coal by the renewable energies, we will need like the 100 times of our renewable right, uh, energies right now. Like the, maybe need uh, 100 times of current renewable energy. This, will require maybe the transition in 30 or 40 years, but definitely not right now. So, so this is kind of a scale question. Like the, we have a very fast increase of a renewable energy and technology, but this cannot meet our current situation as China is a very vast country. They have a lot of population and most of the population, they are living in a very basic standard. They need to improve their living requirement. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to take this opportunity to thank the, the, the panel uh, and just to say that as uh, uh, someone who's been at this for a very long time, it's very encouraging to me to see 
that we have these rising stars. We have the statement that Caitlin made that is so powerful. I think we have the commitment here to try to address this problem. Uh, it's true, we will be using fossil fuels for some time to come, but the imperatives to use them in a way that will not transform the planet out of recognition and create enormous hardships on billions of people in the world. And as the figures from The Economist show us, the uh, cost to our economy of the global warming of four degrees is in the range of five to 20% per year. Uh, that's just not worth it. So we need to figure out how to do this. And I have great confidence that uh, we have here before you examples of those who will help us solve this problem. Thank you all very much. Thank you.